To hold up the record of the safest and most reliable spacecraft ever built, SpaceX's Crew Dragon has applied a traditional yet effective landing method, splashdown for the riskiest phase. Although there is still much controversy surrounding this approach, its effectiveness is still highly appreciated by loyal customers, NASA astronauts, and even foreign astronauts. So, in today's episode of Tech Map, let's listen to what European astronauts think about Dragon's landing process. We will then compare the splashdown with other common landing methods. What do Europe European astronauts think about SpaceX Dragon landing. On March 12, NASA's SpaceX Crew-7 completed the agency's seventh commercial crew rotation mission to the International Space Station after splashing down safely in a Dragon spacecraft off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. The international crew of four spent 199 days in orbit, which included NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbali, ESA astronaut Andreas Mogensen, JAXA astronaut Satoshi Furukawa, and Roscosmos cosmonaut Constantine Team Borisov. Among them, Andreas Mogensen is the first European Space Agency astronaut and first non-American to serve as a pilot on a U.S. commercial crew spacecraft. Clearly, this mission has given him much emotion. Most notably, he was impressed by how smooth a landing SpaceX Dragon was. Mogensen, speaking at his crew's first post-flight news conference at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston on March 25, likened their splashdown to plopping into the water of a swimming pool while wearing a life vest. What I noticed in particular was the the smoothness of the landing compared to my first flight, he said. His first flight was in 2015 aboard a Russian Soyuz spacecraft. The SpaceX Dragon lands in the water, and I think that makes a big difference. It was actually kind of a very soft splash, Mogensen added. NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbali, who commanded Crew-7, agreed that the landing was soft but then found what came next to be rougher than what others observed. I felt like we were really rocking side to side, she said, describing the conclusion of her first space flight. But then everyone I talked to was like, oh, the water was glass when you landed. There was barely any wind. So I definitely felt a lot more motion than there was. For those who don't know, Soyuz also uses parachutes to land like SpaceX, but instead of splashing down like the U.S. vehicle, the Soyuz descent module will touch down on the land. In Kazakhstan, not Russia. Soyuz can land with an accuracy of only 20 kilometers with a probability of 0 0.9997 in the automated aerodynamic descent mode, a U.S. relative to the center of the projected landing area. The main reason for such a low precision is the susceptibility of the parachute landing to winds. Moreover, in case of a ballistic return, the capsule can end up as far as 600 kilometers short of the primary landing site for the aerodynamic mode. As a result, all Soyuz landings have to be planned over flat and open areas without any structures, rivers, or even trees. A total of 13 areas currently meet all the requirements for the Soyuz landing. Ironically, all of these sites are in Kazakhstan and none of them are in Russia. When planning Soyuz landings, engineers usually try to put the spacecraft down into the most preferable area during the first or second orbit of the day as the spacecraft moves on the ascending arc of the orbit from south to north. If this is impossible, they go down the list of 13 sites according to their priority order. If nothing works, mission managers can request an orbit correction or extend the mission to ensure that the ground track of the final orbit goes over the desirable landing site. By contrast, SpaceX Dragon considers the water, typically ocean, as the perfect cushion for the riskiest landing part. SpaceX's splashing down technique, landing in water helps absorb some of the impacts since the properties of water provide more cushion than solid ground. This can reduce the need for an extra braking system within the capsule and provides a safer method of landing for the crew inside. Even though splashdown is generally safe today, there are always risks to this method that engineers must test and design for. The biggest is the possibility of the capsule flooding and sinking while waiting for rescue teams to collect the crew from inside. Fortunately, that did not happen for the Crew-7. To avoid the risk of sinking, the capsule has to meet the strict design requirements making it float easily. Landing capsules naturally float by design since the outer shell is already designed to create an airtight seal that can withstand the vacuum of space. This prevents water from leaking in and flooding the ship while also keeping it afloat. The rounded metal bottom, or top depending on how it lands, works like the hull or bottom of a ship and will bob on the surface of the ocean until rescue crews can reach the capsule. To ensure the safe of the crew, capsules are now designed with additional flotation devices such as emergency rafts that can inflate if needed to increase buoyancy or to upright a ship that has landed top down. Capsules must be able to float for long periods of time as the astronauts rely on boats or helicopters to collect them and the capsule to bring them ashore. Each capsule that has been used in splashdown comes with its own unique features 
methods, and flaws. Splashdown is common for American missions that launch off of the coast because of the agency's easy access to the ocean. Other space agencies, such as those in Russia and China, are restricted to returning crews over land. In those cases, they must incorporate other safety measures, such as rocket boosters, to slow and reduce landing speeds even more. Splashdown landings were used in the return of the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo capsule. The SpaceX capsule Crew Dragon was added to the list as it successfully completed its first crewed landing in the Gulf of Mexico in early August 2020. To be honest, the idea of parachute descent was not the only technique considered for Dragon. Previously, SpaceX had come up with a thrust landing method, propulsive landing. This is one part of its plan to land the Dragon capsule on Mars in 2016. Known as the Red Dragon mission, the capsule was meant to lower itself to solid ground using engines embedded in its hull and then touch down gently on landing legs in a method known as propulsive landing. But Musk then recognized this approach to Dragon was not the right way anymore. This might be explained by several reasons as as follows, most important is safety. Propulsive techniques involve powerful engines and intricate systems that must operate flawlessly to ensure a safe launch, orbital maneuvering, and re-entry. Any failure in propulsion systems could jeopardize the mission and the lives of the crew. Next, propulsive systems must be highly reliable and capable of functioning in various conditions, including extreme temperatures, vacuum environments, and the harsh conditions of space. Achieving this level of reliability often requires extensive testing testing and validation, which can be time-consuming and expensive. Beyond that, propulsive maneuvers for crewed spacecraft, especially during critical phases such as docking with space stations or re-entering Earth's atmosphere, require a high degree of precision. Small errors in trajectory or velocity can have significant consequences, so the propulsion systems must be able to precisely control the spacecraft's movement. Efficiency is also a big matter. Efficient use of propellant is crucial for crewed spacecraft as it affects mission duration, payload capacity, capacity, and overall mission cost. Developing propulsion systems that optimize fuel efficiency while still providing adequate thrust can be a complex engineering challenge. Last but not least, crewed spacecraft must also consider the effects of propulsion on the human occupants. Vibrations, acceleration forces, and noise generated by propulsion systems can impact crew comfort, health, and performance. Designing propulsive techniques that minimize these effects requires careful consideration of human factors. Of course, Dragon 2 is still capable of landing propulsively because its abort system is equipped with a set of Super Draco. However, without landing legs, landing with the engines would be extra difficult to pull off. You'd have to land it on some pretty soft landing pad, he said. If you add those legs to the vehicle, the dead mass will also be increased, affecting the payload capacity of the vehicle as well as other factors. As a result, SpaceX is back to the traditional approach, splashing down in the ocean by parachutes. Since the SpaceX Dragon spacecraft conducted its historic mission, namely Crew Dragon Demo 2 in May 2020, the vehicle has set and kept a record that any space company at first glance would find embarrassing. That is becoming the safest crewed spacecraft ever built. This is exactly the most realistic evidence for the declaration of Gwyn Shotwell, SpaceX's president and chief operating officer. Astronaut and personnel safety is SpaceX's highest priority. It can be said that placing people as the guideline for all actions is the secret to helping SpaceX come up with breaking ideas, leading them to the top notch in the aerospace industry. On a winning streak, the company recently demonstrated another innovation toward astronaut safety that promises to reshape future spaceflight. On Thursday, March 21, SpaceX launched its 30th cargo mission, known as CRS-30 to the ISS for NASA. Over 2,721 kilograms of scientific supplies, maintenance equipment, two new coffee kits, fresh fruits and vegetables, and other food for the station's inhabitants are stowed aboard Dragon on CRS-30 a Falcon 9 rocket carrying an uncrewed cargo Dragon spacecraft lifted off at 4.55 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time from Space Launch Complex 40, SLC-40, at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. The mission was the first cargo launch from SLC-40 since March 2020. Wow, what an impression. On the contrary, on the same day, another vehicle was not so lucky. The Russian Soyuz spacecraft encountered an unknown problem leading to a delay. Specifically, 
The Soyuz MS-25 mission was prepared to launch in the morning, but the mission abort was triggered at T-20 seconds after the second umbilical was retracted and prior to engine sequence start. No explanation yet from Russian flight controllers. The translated audio loop indicated launch would be delayed at least 24 hours. The NASA commentator said the next opportunity would be Saturday. According to the rumors, the abort was caused by the supporting structures of the launch table which did not move properly. Such an error is usually considered quite seriously because it could lead to several potential issues depending on the specific circumstances and severity of the problem. One of which is safety risks. Malfunctioning supporting structures pose safety risks to personnel working on or around the launch pad. If the structures fail unexpectedly during operations, it could result in injury or even loss of life. Thereby, there is no doubt that not only during the flight, but even before launch, ensuring human safety must also be emphasized. It explains why SpaceX added another layer of safety capabilities, but not in the spacecraft, in the pad instead. Indeed, on March 20, SpaceX's president and chief operating officer Gwen Shotwell shared a funny video that appeared to show her in an IV a suit taking the ride down the chute from Pad 40 Crew Tower in Florida. In the comment section below, many users expressed their interest in the video, highly appreciating SpaceX's efforts to protect the astronauts. To be honest, that escape chute at SLC 40 was tested once previously on February 26 and would be used in an emergency to help astronauts and ground crews quickly get away from the pad. The Lunar Starship will be equipped with four landing legs. Similar to what was used during the space shuttle days. However, instead of riding a basket from the top of the tower, emergency personnel will slide down a chute that carries them several hundred feet from the rocket. What's more, this chute will also be used for Starship and its future commercial space flights. Therefore, simplification is appreciated here, and of course, it's safer than sitting in a small basket up high. The team took commercially available off-the-shelf technology and applied it to the crew tower. Kiko Donchev, SpaceX's vice president of launch, wrote on X, you are trained on it the same way you are trained on using an emergency exit door on airplane. Only takes a couple of quick physical actions to deploy the slide and anyone can effectively do it. This system will help us scale to bigger towers and spaceships. Think 100 people on Starship, Donchev wrote. As I said above, under the CRS-30 mission, Dragon's second-generation vehicle lifted off for the first time from the north end of Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, Florida. By the way, the new escape system could also get a trial run. Fortunately, everything went smoothly. No accidents were recorded. Bill Gerstenmeyer, SpaceX's Vice President of Build and Flight Reliability emphasized that SpaceX was near the end game of certifying Pad 40 to support the Dragon mission. His saying was given during a recent post-flight readiness review leading up to crew eight astronauts launch on March 1. We would like to do a cargo flight first, if we can, and we think CRS-30 is probably the right time to do that, Gersten Meyer said, and the work's pretty much completed at the pad, Got some stuff to do next week, but we'll be in good shape for CRS-30. The addition of new infrastructure at SLC-40 is considered a long-term solution for the traffic congestion in LC-39A. Both SLC-40 and LC-39A were hired by SpaceX to launch their vehicles. However, since the Dragon V-1 was retired, something has changed. In 2018 and 2019, LC-39A was outfitted for Cargo Dragon and Crew Dragon missions ahead of the company's first human spaceflight mission in 2020. Since 2020, all of SpaceX's crew and cargo launches to the space station have departed from there. Additionally, the launch cadence for Dragon missions was increased drastically. This year alone, the company plans nearly 150 Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy launches. What's an impressive number but also causes a big problem. When you're flying rockets every two or three days, the conflict between two missions in terms of the same launch slots is inevitable. Of course, we cannot share those burdens for SLC-40 because LC-39A is the only pad currently certified for human spaceflight. It explains why the soon upgrade at the neighboring Cape Canaveral Space Force Station to expand its crew launch capacity is so important. The company is nearly there. 
Last fall, SpaceX workers installed a crew access arm to the launch tower, a key piece of infrastructure that allows astronauts access to the Crew Dragon spacecraft. In the last few months, the equipment necessary has been outfitted on the launch pad to support launches of human spaceflight missions on the Crew Dragon spacecraft. This week, we saw the use of the newly installed launch tower and crew access arm at SLC-40 to load time-limited experiments and supplies into the Dragon cargo bay atop the Falcon 9 rocket. Historically, Pad 40 has kind of become our high-rate pad, Sarah Walker, SpaceX's Director of Dragon Mission Management, said, we've gotten the time between launches down to just a couple of days. We've been trying to build up redundant Dragon capability on our two neighboring pads, Walker said. It gives us the flexibility that if there's ever a traffic conflict on 39A and two missions have to launch at the same time, and one of them is a Dragon, now we can move over to SLC-40 and prioritize both of those missions. SLC-40 is expected to serve a Crew Dragon launch with astronauts later this year. NASA is in the process of reviewing SpaceX's changes at SLC-40 to officially certify the pad for crewed missions. Their purpose is to have SLC-40 available in time for the launch of the next space station crew, Crew-9, scheduled to fly no earlier than August. It's good to have that redundancy, Steve Stitch, the program manager for NASA's commercial crew program, said. It's great to see the space travel industry growing rapidly and private companies like SpaceX making efforts to help bring humans closer to the dream of multi-planetary life. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. If you want to explore more aspects of the world's most powerful rockets and the world of rockets in general, here is a selection of deeper dive videos for you. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.